Um, thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so yes, today I'm going to talk about um, whether the tools of evolutionary ecology, behavioral ecology can help us to understand religious beliefs and practices. And um, I'm going to actually talk about, no, sorry, so, okay. I'm actually going to talk about three studies today that I've done in over the last um, three or four years. And for those of you that know my work, obviously I'm a human behavioral ecologist, which means I'm interested in understanding how ecology can explain the evolutionary origins of behavior. And I've worked on lots of different kinds of behavior, although working on religion is a relatively new departure for me. So um, this isn't exactly my life's work, but it's a interesting area. And in, in some ways, something of an evolutionary puzzle. So let me just quickly say, I'm gonna talk about three papers, one on the ecology of donations to religious institutions. Um, which was published a couple of years ago. The second paper, we're going to talk about the co-evolution of afterlife beliefs and revolution, which was um, published recently. And the third is work in progress on religious celibacy. So why be a monk? And why in all this talk really means why in the kind of Thunberg and four why sense of um, evolutionary function is what we're really trying to get at here. So one of the reasons this is a bit of a puzzle is that religious behavior can involve very costly obligations like prayer. So here's a picture of um, some Tibetan Buddhists um, throwing pair, prayer papers up to the uh, Buddhas who are riding in the sky. Um, pilgrimage. So pilgrimage might be a short walk, a long walk, walking around a temple. Um, in some cases, as here, some pilgrimages involve every third step prostrating yourself on the ground. So that you can imagine is extremely costly and people may walk like this for days um, or even months. Like you can only imagine the energetic cost of doing that. Uh, some religious displays are um, actually involve some sort of harmful uh, or painful practices. And I'll whiz on from that in case anyone doesn't like sight of blood. Um, and more to the point, also individuals can give a huge proportion of their wealth to religious institutions. Um, so in the case of Tibetan Buddhism, relatively poor people might give very large amounts of money to um, sustain monasteries. And actually monasteries uh, in this part of the world generally don't necessarily grow their own food. They're surviving off uh, money for the religious services they provide and, and from donations from their local community. So these are, these are the, this is the large cost paid by individuals and in society to be explained. So one of the um, explanations that's been given, if you like, uh, another sort of cultural uh, or perhaps approximate explanations for religious belief is fear of divine punishment. So most religions um, have some kind of uh, sense that you'll be punished either in this life or the next if you don't follow agreed religious norms, social norms, cooperative norms. This is an example of the Tibetan uh, reincarnation wheel. So this is a sort of big picture that you're likely to see near the entrance of um, Tibetan Buddhist temple, you'll see some version of this. And um, the, the segments of this circle of life are, so Tibetan Buddhism actually believe that you're rewarded or punished in the next life for how you behave in this life. So uh, reincarnation occurs. And um, according to how you behave in your previous life, you may come back as another human. You may end up as an, anim an animal. Um, as you can see from this picture, you may end up in hell, and I'm reliably informed there are 18 different types of hell in Tibetan Buddhism, all of which are shown on this picture. So, for example, there's uh, something, hang on, let me put my pointer on while we're, I don't know if you can see my pointer. So there's some sorts of hell that are to do with fire, there are some to do with water. Uh, there, are, I don't even know what's going on down here, but you definitely don't want to be here. So these are... Um, uh, you know, punishments, if you like, for uh, not living a good life 
as I said, you may come back, if you come back into the human life, you may come back as a farmer, for example, quite likely you may come back as a monk. And as a monk, it's possible that you may even attain uh, enlightenment. So this picture here is the escape, if you like, from the cycle of reincarnation. And um, essentially you've become a Buddha and the Buddha Buddhas actually can return to live amongst men if they choose, but that's the only way out of this cycle of reincarnation, which is sometimes described as a, a, almost a cycle of suffering. Um, this is uh, what I thought was a very similar picture, to be honest, from a cathedral in the south of France in Albi. And as you can see, again, individual souls are being judged and uh, being sent uh, down to hell. So quite a lot of... Uh, Similarities, so Tibetan Buddhism is obviously a karmic religion, whereas uh, Christianity is an Abrahamic uh, religion, but 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 certain degree of overlap in this particular idea. So as a behavioral ecologist, I'm sort of interested in, you know, where do these beliefs come from? Why do we follow them? And you could take approximate view and say, well, religious norms just uh, drive behavior, a lot of cultural evolutionary models assume that you're exposed to a religious code of practice and that determines how you behave and that's fair enough. That's probably a good proximate model for how a lot of people um, behave. You don't necessarily have to think about ecology, but if you're interested in a more sort of ultimate explanation, why are some groups behaving differently from others, then you might have a view of ecology driving behavior and religious norms or rules kind of emerging from that. So to give an example of something like monogamy, you might believe that, okay, so these people are monogamous because Christian teaching tells them they have to be. These people are polygynous because they're Muslims and it's fine to be polygynous. Um, or you might say, well, these people are living somewhere where um, ecology required you know a high level of paternal investment and so they were monogamous anyway and religious norms emerged from that whereas those people were living somewhere where they were polygynous anyway so religious norms emerged from that and then there might be for example reinforcement so religious norms um, having been established might make behavior particularly difficult to change so this doesn't really include any of the sort of cognitive uh, steps but simply having a think about can ecology be used to explain variation in human behavior and in particular uh, religious behavior. Oops. Why does it not want to go into, oh, there we go. Okay, so the first paper we um, want to tell you about was our study we did on looking at what motivated religious donations and this was published in Royal Society of Open Science back in 2019 and um, we're interested in to what extent reputation or fear of divine punishment was guiding um, behavior in an economic game so I just introduced my co-authors here Yan Chen Nahao and uh, Jar Jar who um, were all at the time based at Lanzhou University and um, which was where we kind of based our study in central China. And we did this lab and field economic game where we were looking at a donation in both a sort of public and private context. And our sort of experimental uh, variation on top of that was, was we played the game actually at 52 different sites, 11 of which were in cities and 17 of which were in small villages. So that was our sort of proxy for reputational concern in that um, basically, if you're living uh, in a city, then obviously people are um, you know, less well known to you than if you're living in a small village. So just a quick, this is quite a complicated experiment. I'll just explain one part of it here. We gave everybody uh, 10 yuan and then we, so it was a sort of, it was sort of a, it was what we called a free donation game. They could choose to keep it or they could choose to give it to uh, one of four um, institutions, two of which were charities, one of which was uh, 
the nearest mosque uh, um, and one of which was the nearest uh, monastery. So um, if people, so this uh, area of China includes atheists, it includes Muslims, it includes Buddhists. And for the most part, uh, atheists chose the two charities. Muslims chose the mosque and a charity. Tibetans and Buddhists chose the uh, monastery and a charity. And I think one person chose the mosque and the monastery <laughs> out of 500. Um, so it was a good way of uh, varying both who they were giving to. And in each case, they could um, choose how much to give and how much to keep from themselves. So that's pretty standard um, economic game. Now, just to show you where we were playing it. So as I said, community size was up. So this is a map of China, um, just in the inset here in this yellow square is kind of where we were based, which is actually somewhere called Gansu province in Western China. And this is the Tibetan autonomous region here, um, but actually, which is quite strictly regulated. It, you know, there's all sorts of conditions for travel in this area, but actually the Tibetan plateau extends right into Gansu province and through Qinghai and through part of Sichuan. And um, so our study sites included, um, so the green are Muslim, the the red are Buddhist, uh, yellow is mixed, white is uh, atheist, mainly atheist. And some of the groups up here are on the edge of the Tibetan plateau. This is kind of called the borderlands really. But anyway, 17 communities, six in cities, 11 in villages. And if you look at the difference in those characteristics, perhaps one of the biggest differences was how long you've been living there. So people living in villages have been living there their whole life. Whereas most people in cities had only been living there less than three years. So, and also the size of the community obviously was very, very different. So reputation is different, not only because of the size of the community that you're living in, but also the length of time you've been living there and the length of time people around you have been living there. So in other words, in villages, absolutely everyone knows everyone else. In big cities, nobody does. Here's a summary of our results on that donation game. So, as I say, one of our primary interests was, we thought if there are reputational concerns, then can you, the community you're in is going to matter a lot. Um, whereas if it's divine punishment, maybe your beliefs in divine punishment and reward um, are going to matter. And in fact, community size mattered a lot. So people living in small communities did give more. And that's controlling for um, several things here. So poverty, poor people gave less. Education, educated people gave more. Uh, choice was which charities they chose. And it, interestingly, the religious and non-religious charities were not different. Um, whereas divine reward and punishment, uh, funnily enough, that wasn't particularly significant. So religious practice was a positive predictor of making a large donation, as you might expect, and as others have found. Um, but it was it was actually the sort of active part of it. So religious practice was how often you went to the mosque or the monastery, um, whereas the beliefs part of it, um, we, we did a principle com component analysis, I should say, and this principle component wasn't really what was driving things as far as we could see. It was much more the practice up here. So I know that others have found different results from that, but uh, I think this was quite a robust result in that we had a lot of um, diversity in kind of where we were playing the game. We had the same team playing the game and uh, we had, you know, Buddhists, atheists, uh, Muslims, all playing the game. Um, so, um, Perhaps that sort of idea that uh, fear of divine punishment, it sort of makes sense, but it didn't seem to be the most important factor that was going on here, whereas community size definitely did seem to be something of an issue. So this is just summarizing what we just said. Uh, so, you know, financial security, living in small communities and religious practice were all associated with larger donations, which suggests reputation of your community is definitely an issue given the constraints of your financial circumstances but some of the things you might think were important like divine punishment 
or whether or not the donation was to a religious or non-religious institution, at least in this Chinese context, didn't seem to be uh, very important. Now, I know the economic games are very context dependent, so it's difficult to make broad sweeping analogies, but we did think we'd try. So this is look at, you know, to some extent you're looking at proximate determinants and trying to make a jump from that as to what is the kind of ultimate driving importance of these religious uh, beliefs. But um, we thought we'd also try and use another, we would take a different approach to look at the effect of uh, changes over evolutionary time. So, you know, if you're thinking of Tinbergen's four whys, this is also an evolutionary explanation, but it's more looking at the kind of, what, are the, what is the kind of evolutionary history of these changes? Can that tell us something about how these beliefs evolve? Well, and one of the ways that one can try and look at that is through phylogenetics, which um, is quite a powerful way of looking at evolutionary history. So, the second study is looking at the co-evolution of eschatological beliefs and revolution and warfare. So in case you don't know what eschatological means, it means beliefs about the fate of the soul and apocalypse. So religious studies, uh, it, within the religious studies literature, it has been noted there's an association between apocalyptic belief. So apocalyptic belief is belief that the end of times is imminent and uh, basically particular revolutionary violence or possibly outgroup violence so which we've called revolutionary and religiously motivated violence when we're talking about aggression between groups so one is more like revolution one is more like warfare basically so we thought well okay this association's been noted let's see whether it um whether we can spot it in a sort of phylogenetic analysis and whether we can work out you know, whether this co-evolution is really happening. So this actually, as I said, I didn't really know anything about um, Islamic history until a couple of years ago. Uh, so this uh, project was the idea of, of my former master student, uh, Kiran Basava, and she had a background in um, religious studies and she put together this amazing uh, phylogeny of Islamic sects. And um, this is actually, quite an interesting way of uh, conducting, creating a phylogeny. Those of you that followed my other work on cultural phylogenetics will know that I've, you know, we normally use language as a kind of marker of cultural evolution. It has fantastic properties for making great phylogenetic trees. It's very frequency dependent, um, but um, I haven't not tried normally before uh, making phylogenies out of other traits because many of them don't have the kind of qualities of a trait that might pick up, a, you know, a phylogeny might be a good model. But actually, religious history seems to work um, extremely well. So these are religious groups. I should point out that this, you know, Islam is quite a young religion. So history is entirely documented in the sort of historical period. There are writings. Um, which Kiran looked through. And as you can see, she collected data on 77 uh, Islamic sects, many of whom are still extant today, uh, many of whom have gone extinct. And the interesting thing about creating a phylogeny, if you like, from the bottom up, in other words, from historical records, rather than, um, in, in evolutionary biology, we normally infer phylogenies by looking at diversity in the present which is a very powerful technique, you know, devised by evolutionary biologists looking at the history of species, and sometimes with a little help from fossils. Uh, whereas here we've got tons of fossils because we've got the history. And the, and the wonderful thing about doing it this way is that we can see everything that would be missing to us if we were constructing it from the top down. In other words, all these groups that are now extinct. Um, and that actually brings in my second collaborator on this uh, project, uh, Han Jamei Jiang, who's interested particularly in cultural extinction and a phylogeny of this type enables us to measure that. So why do we want to sort of, I mean, it's an amazing phylogeny, as I say, I'll just go back to it. So these, uh, these orange, orange groups here are um, uh, groups that are now extinct, but have given rise to other groups, some of which may still be extant. 
um, and others are just completely, uh, as I said, lost to, lost to history. And I mean, some historians and whatever have said to us, well, you know, why do you want to reduce Islamic history to this very simplified tree? And, you know, the answer is, yeah, of course, it's a simplified tree. But when you model something, that's what you do. You make a simplified representation. And one of the reasons why a phylogeny is a useful representation is that we can then bring in all the tools from evolutionary biology to do with building dating trees, coding characters, testing, you know, phylogenetic signal and, and inferring ancestral states. These are all things that evolutionary biologists have thought hard about and developed statistical tools to work out. So here's our tree, by the way, we've on this tree, we've coded apocalyptic belief. Okay, this is one of the things we're interested in, whether it's driving warfare. So pink, um, so in the extant world, you know, pink groups are groups that have apocalyptic beliefs, blue are those that don't. Now we might know from the historical record whether or not groups had apocalyptic beliefs. If we don't know, we've had to infer it statistically. So for example, this node here, 50-50 means we really don't know. Whereas this node here, much more likely that they didn't, either because we have historical information or, you know, the statistics make it look that way. So we can use all those phylogenetic, you know, methods to try and help fill in the history here. And then the thing that obviously I've most used phylogenetics methods for is to try and look for coevolution. So I'm using uh, a method uh, originally devised by uh, 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 Mark Pagel in a package called Discrete, which is now in uh, Bayesian. So it's in a program called Bayes Traits, which is uh, publicly available in the University of Reading site and elsewhere. Um, but the way this works is it actually compares two models of evolution. Um, so it, we know that um, traits are changing and it might be that these two traits are changing on the tree completely independently of each other. So you've got apocalyptic belief being lost and gained. Um, you've got revolution coming and going, but the two have got nothing to do with each other. In which case this model where you estimate rates of change rates of gain, rates of loss in the two traits, but the two traits are not co-evolving. They have nothing to do with each other. That was what we've called the independent model. Or maybe the two are co-evolving. In other words, this model should be better. This is the dependent model where, so for example, if, if, tra if trait X is going to go from naught to one, depends or not on whether or not trait Y is at naught and one. And then you need a more complicated model with eight transition rate parameters here. So this is what we call the dependent model. And what the program discrete does is it, it compares these two evolutionary models and over a Bayesian, um, using a Bayesian approach, and it tells you which one best fits. So you may have seen lots of um, um, sort of phylogenetic regressions or lots of methods which describe themselves as phylogenetic, but they're, they sort of control for phylogeny but they're still basically regressions, whereas this method is actually testing two different models of evolutionary history. So I think this is much more powerful use of phylogenetic statistics than most papers that you'll see, because it's really getting at, you know, regressions can't really tell us about the direction of change, but these models are really trying to do that. So to cut a long story short, we, use the phylogeny I've just described, we use the character states that um, I've just described, and we looked and we tested the independent and the dependent model, and we did in fact find evidence that actually the dependent model fitted much better. In other words, apocalyptic beliefs and revolution are co-evolving, that model fits much better. Um, now, so therefore we've got this more complicated model with eight transition parameters being Estimated. So if you've got kind of cultural states bouncing around in evolutionary history, as it were, let's say you start off with neither apocalyptic beliefs or revolution in your population, 
maybe you gain a, a revolution, so revolution starts happening, and then maybe apocalyptic beliefs follow that, in which case you're, you would move here, and then you might lose, rev revolution may stop, you might uh, therefore end up here. Um, so you can estimate all these transition rates, and you can also remove them from the model. And the dotted line means I can remove them from the model and the model fits better or doesn't fit any worse. And in fact, what we found is this transition never happened. So in fact, if you have the idea that apocalyptic beliefs cause revolution, in other words, you think the end of the world is coming and therefore you might as well just fight. That's a perfectly plausible hypothesis, but we don't find any support for that because this arrow doesn't happen. It seems to be the other way around in that if you're here and revolution starts happening, then um, either the revolution could end again or apocalyptic beliefs may arise and you end up here. Um, so yes, indeed, there is an association between apocalyptic beliefs and revolution as religious studies literature had thought in a sort of non-quantitative way might be happening. Um, but according to our results, the revolution or warfare, so by the way, this was looking at revolution, so this is within group violence. We also did it between group violence and we got almost exactly the same pattern actually, although less significant. Um, but in either case, the warfare seems to generate the apocalyptic beliefs rather than vice versa. So I would say we didn't really have evidence that beliefs are driving warfare or violence. We would say that violence is probably driving belief in this case. Now, also mentioned cultural extinction was something we could look at using this phylogenetic approach. And um, because we have branch lengths on a phylogeny and many of the tips of those phylogenies um, either resulted in you know, the extinction of that particular religious sect, that historical religious sect, um, we, could, we actually used a sort of survival analysis framework to look at the survival along the branches of the tree so that we could look at, um, you know, basically, you know, borrowing methods from demography, really, looking at um, survival curves. And so how does apocalyptic beliefs affect the survival of the group? I mean, is it, you know, is it an adaptation? Well, funnily enough, not. So um, apocalyptic beliefs, it's almost, I'm not quite sure what to make of it really, because apocalyptic beliefs says that you believe the end of times are near. Well, it does seem to have predictive power that the end of your particular religious group may indeed be near. So um, if you look, um, for example, at panel B, this is the survival of religious sects that do not have apocalyptic beliefs is the blue line and the red line is the survival of religious uh, sects that do have apocalyptic beliefs. And it's a dramatically significant difference. And just to take another um, eschatological belief by means of comparison. Uh, so many of these groups, I mean, you may not associate Islam with reincarnation beliefs, but actually about seven out of the 77 groups did have reincarnation beliefs. We don't know if that's because they were previously Buddhist groups or uh, living in, in Buddhist areas. But anyway, interestingly enough, um, that has no impact on the survival probability of the sect, um, whereas apocalyptic beliefs are strongly associated. And that might just be because, as we've already said, they're associated with revolutionary or religious violence. So again, if you just look at the presence or absence of violence and the survival of the sect, um, you also get a similar effect. So both revolutionary and religious violence are associated with cultural extinction in this case. So it enables us to look at a really quite sort of fine scale at trying to work out what are the evolutionary trajectories that are going on here. Okay, study number three. So this is work in progress. The other two are published. The first one I said in Royal Society of Open Science and the second one in Nature Human Behavior. Um, why be a monk? Okay, so this is a little bit more um, early days. So, 
this is really looking at the idea of religious celibacy. So this is, a, you know, of all the costly traits that I described at the beginning, I don't, I don't think I mentioned celibacy, but um, celibacy is obviously a pretty costly trait if you're talking evolutionary terms and um, whether it's a decision you make yourself or if you send your small child to join the monastery. So in Tibetan uh, monasteries, uh, children are sent normally under the age of 12. Um, you know, they are foregoing the opportunity to reproduce. So one would assume harming their reproductive success massively. So why, why would such a trait evolve? And why would it be common? And in, um, you know, re recent history in Tibetan areas, something like one in seven boys often sent to the monastery. So it's massive. Um, is it that monasteries are powerful institutions and people really don't have much choice but to send their children, for example, even though it's harming their own interests, their own inclusive fitness, possibly even their own desires? Or is there some sort of evolutionary uh, benefit? And I should mention my collaborators again here. So um, uh, Alberto Micheletti has been modeling the inclusive fitness of um, being a monk and whether this is a trait that could evolve. Um, and the rest of the team are similar uh, to the team who did the earlier study, Aha, Yuan, um, and also two others, Li Chong and Joanne, and several other helpers who helped us get data on the fitness implications of being a monk. Okay, so what does being a monk mean in Tibetan uh, Buddhism? Well, um, monasteries were incredibly powerful and important seats of uh, learning and power. So I don't really know how to uh, best describe them because I think when you go there, you do, you do get a, a strong sense of it being a little bit like a university in that some of the big monasteries, they have philosophy schools, they have medical schools, they have uh, um, a lot of uh, um, learning going on. So there's a lot of praying going on. So they are, they are a temple, but they're also a university, they're a school, they're, they're, they're a bit like a bank in that um, you know, individuals are giving the money, but you know there, there are also occasions where they might help people out um and they they even um you know they might almost like a court so they might decide uh, who's you know in the case of disputes who's a, who's guilty who's innocent um and obviously you know they just held a lot of political power so um it, it you know they these are clearly important institutions locally and now i'm talking of course uh, tibetan buddhism but obviously we, we you know before the reformation of the monasteries they were important institutions across europe and equivalent uh, institutions exist you know globally where there are um similar religions so this is not unique um to tibet so this actually this picture here um i took at sira monastery in lhasa um so uh, Lhasa, by the way, is right over on the sort of western, um, that's the capital uh, city in the Tibetan Autonomous Region. And this would have been one, the Sira Monastery was used to be one of the sort of biggest and most important monasteries. Um, and one of the things the monks do pretty much every day are these debates. And these monks are debating it's a, it's a kind of interesting, I could never work out quite how much of it was ritual and how much it was like actual debate because one partner sits down, the other one stands up and they have a very uh, stereotyped kind of um, mode of communication. Um, um, but, you know, in they do actually have, you know, debating competitions where monks from one monastery go off and debate with monks from another monastery. So it's a really important part of uh, every day. Uh, that was, you know, over in Lhasa, whereas our study, so that was, you know, as I said before, right over on the western side of the Tibetan plateau. Our study site, as you would tell from the previous map, is right over on the eastern side of the Tibetan plateau. So we're not actually in the Tibetan autonomous region. So it's a little bit more relaxed. It's a bit easier to travel here. Um, but, you know, we're still up on the Tibetan plateau, as I said, where uh, Tibetan Buddhism is very important. Now, 
the Tibetan plateau is kind of largely a pastoralist area where people are farming yaks and sheep and uh, doing a little bit of farming and are, ma are mainly nomadic. So historically, there would have been very few towns and the only towns there were were really some settlements based around monasteries. So monasteries were really the main sort of focus of settlements that older people might live in the town. Uh, pilgrims who are coming to visit the monastery you might need restaurants, places to stay, blah, blah, blah. So small towns would grow up around monasteries and obviously monks would be residing in monasteries. Um, so actually in this picture here, the, the sort of I'm actually up on the roof of this monastery and you can see the monks houses just to the left and the town that's kind of sprung up around it um, ahead of me. Um, and then typical Tibetan landscape, hills, grazing area in the background. And um, these towns are growing very fast at the moment because there's been a general push to settle the population. Um, this, this monastery is still relatively uh, small community, beautiful area. Um, on the day, on the day that I took this photo, I was actually visiting the monastery. We're pretty much right up on the roof here at the top of the monastery. And the whole place is completely empty. So we were wondering what's going on. We went back down to town and they said, no, 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 the monks are all on like summer holiday at the moment. So these, these white tents over in the corner were the monks all going off and uh, having two weeks uh, summer holiday. So we thought, oh, that's interesting. We'll go and say hi. So uh, here they are on summer holiday. So here are some young monks playing ping pong. And um, it's, it's interesting, I think, to see, uh, these are the older monks having a picnic in the back there and uh, the tents are where they're sleeping and each tent sort of people you, you keep the monasteries are somewhat structured around the village you came from as a young monk so you will sleep in a tent with individuals which i mean you know i don't know what their sleeping arrangements are actually in the monastery but this was sort of replicating it i think and that's my understanding so each tent represented a certain area of where these monks came from so you can see the monks are quite young when they arrive um you can see that they're not allowed to wear shirts or trousers and it's cold on the tibetan plateau i mean this picture is taken in i mean i was going to show you the video i don't know i think i won't because i'll blow up zoom but uh you can sort of hear the wind blowing. It's not warm, even in summer. And um, at this guy wearing the wearing the warmer clothes, that's just one of the brothers of one of the monks who's come to visit and say hi. And uh, I also noticed they're really awful at ping pong. So in other words, they don't do this every evening. This is like something they do two weeks of the year on holiday. They are not good at ping pong or football, which is what they were also trying to play because most of the time they're actually living quite an arduous uh, life. A lot of time is spent. Uh, so it's costly, it's, it's devotion to your religion. And a lot of time is spent praying. I don't have photos of people praying because they don't like you taking photos inside mosque. But when you see all these boots outside the prayer hall, that means everyone inside is praying and that can go on literally all morning. Um, there's like physical exercise, there's uh, hard work to do with keeping the monastery alive and running. Um, there's study, endless study. So they have to learn all these scripts and sutras. And um, this photo in the right hand corner here. Um, I don't, if any of you are paleoanthropologists, you might be quite excited by these kind of red handprints all over the wall. I didn't even notice them when I took the photo, but that's actually how people like sign a document. Um, but the document was quite interesting because this document is listing the exam results of all the little monks. And um, it's also listing um, how much their parents have donated to the monastery. So I thought that was a fairly unsubtle uh, link between the two. And so not only do you, when you donate your child to the monastery, you're also still expected to make uh, financial donations to the monastery and uh, to help keep everything running. So this is costly. Um, that having said, I mean, the monks do retain their connection with their family. So this young monk here, um, he's actually returned for the weekend to his sisters had a baby. So, He's meeting his uh, 
nephew and people talk about having a family monk so this is a you know this is a relationship that can last you know even though monks are living in a monastery uh, completely separately they don't marry they don't have children um but they they do come back and provide religious services at weddings and funerals and other situations and uh you know everyone talks about having a, you know a family monk so the link with the family is definitely uh, not lost okay back to the evolution so monks kin selection model is it possible that sending kids off to the monastery could evolve through kin selection and this is the problem that alberto was addressing and uh basically asking the hypothetical question so is this trait that the probability that a juvenile dread, uh, male becomes a monk can it evolve when it involves abstaining from participating in competition for reproductive opportunities so our assumption is that when you become a monk, you're stepping out of reproductive competition. You're just saying, I'm not going to, I'm not going to compete for the means of reproduction. So this is the model is basically based on Hamilton's rule. So if you're giving up reproduction, so celibacy is obviously extremely costly. And um, that cost might have some element of uh, frequency dependence in that. Um, so here's the cost minus C. Uh, if lots of other individuals in your population are also becoming monks, then the reproductive success of those who are not monks might be quite good because they have lots of opportunities um, and therefore it's even more costly. So there's some frequency dependence in this. Um, but, you know, we've now learned that whenever there's sort of somebody giving up reproductive opportunities, if we're trying to model this, we have to think, well, that's the cost, but there's also a benefit to other people in the community because this is going to open up more reproductive slots, as it were. So this term is the cost to the individual, but this is the benefit to his relatives in the community who might be taking up those reproductive opportunities. And this term here is whether or not males disperse. In other words, if, if males are dispersing, they're not going to benefit from that, but other unrelated males may come in, but re related males will get that benefit. So this term here just describes the inclusive fitness benefits of those remaining in the community who take up those reproductive slots, which will be tempered by their uh, relatedness to the individual. And so you can just see that this term can never be bigger than that term. R is always less than one. So basically, celibacy doesn't make sense in evolutionary terms. You're giving up a reproductive slot. You're giving it to people who are less related to you than you are to yourself, and therefore it shouldn't evolve. Okay, what if the parent's making the decision, not you? Well, the, the same equation holds, but the cost is balanced by the parent's relatedness to the offspring and the benefits are balanced by the parent's relatedness to the other um, boys in the village, as it were. And again, that term can't be bigger than that term. So even if the parent's making the decision, that doesn't seem to make reproductive sense. Right. Why is that not? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, but if we actually make the competition um, much more local and we assume that the benefits um, are not just to the broader community, but there are particular benefits that go straight to your brothers, then the equation looks a little bit different. So the, the individual is still paying this huge cost. But let's say that a part of the benefit, rather than just going to the whole community, goes to your brothers who are related to you. And therefore, the benefit that goes to the whole community this time is the same. So it's just what's left of the benefit goes to the rest of the community. Is it possible that this could be greater than zero? Well, it is, if this term is large. So in theory, celibacy could evolve if this term is large. And if we look at 
per parents making the decision. Now, the reason I keep talking about parents making the decision is obviously if boys are going to the monastery age seven, you know, clearly this is largely because their parents have decided this is a good thing for them to do. So um, they have, um, you know, if you've got the benefit here and benefit here, then uh, can this exceed zero? And yes, the answer is yes. So if the benefits are large, then um, under individual control, if the benefit's large, it's, it's never going to be a very high level of celibacy, but some very small proportion of celibacy could evolve. But if the parent's making the decision, then uh, a larger level can evolve. So there you go. That's, uh, that's looking like, you know, that's getting to sort of realms of more like what we're seeing. So the actual number's a bit hard to estimate what, you know, they mean, but, you know, in theory, there seems to be a certain amount of parent offspring conflict going, going on here. But if parents are winning, then the system of being a monk should actually survive and, and, and benefit. So can we test that? Well, we do have demographic data from these populations and we don't have it from the actual uh, monasteries themselves, but we have it from the communities from which individuals are going to become monks. And um, in our demographic census, we asked what became of everybody, including whether they went to be a monk. So it's actually possible for us to look at the reproductive success of monks and their family. So again, to cut a long story short, we looked at the brothers of celibate monks. So if you remember, that was a key term in Alberto's model. Are the brothers, do you benefit if your brother becomes a monk? And if so, then we think it's really quite possible for this system to evolve. And um, we basically looked at um, families with what here's data. So this is data from families with one brother or families with two or more brothers. And in both cases, um, being a brother of a celibate monk was great. You did better than individuals that were not. Uh, what about being a sister? Well, I haven't, I haven't talked that much about women, but actually, um, does that benefit apply to sisters as well as brothers? Well, if we look down at the bottom here, um, actually the answer is no. So being a sister of a monk is not particularly beneficial, whereas being the sister-in-law of a monk, in other words, being married to the brother of a monk is beneficial. So in other words, that brother benefit is also showing up through the reproductive success of the female. So this shows that that benefit is not through polygyny, it's actually through, um, you know, even being married to one of these guys is beneficial. So we do think that the benefit is arising here out of the resources that the individual's giving up when he decides to become a celibate monk, which is then going to the rest of the family. So in other words, the sort of over division of these resources is costly. So what about grandparents? Well, this is really the inclusive fitness. So in other words, if you as a father ask one of your, or give one of your children to the monastery, how does it affect the number of uh, grandchildren? So here's one of the elders, Tibetan elders on his horse. And again, um, this is just showing the raw data for families with uh, either uh, one to two um, children, three to four or more than four. Uh, sorry, um, and basically the number of grandchildren in every case was more in the case of the father of a celibate monk. And when family sizes were large, it was significantly more. So as predicted by the model, it's actually not costly to have some children be a monk. It's actually um, not associated with any penalty to your reproductive success and possibly an advantage. So, I mean, I'm sort of, I, I just, I mean, coming back to that, there's been a lot of talk about how, I mean, theoretically, I theory, I think we have the case of a sort of, I'm just going, sorry, going back to here. It's almost, so here you've got a case of a sort of a religious institution, if you like, um, almost emerging out of kin-selected benefits. 
<laughs> so just summarizing over what I've said so far. Um, on the macro evolutionary level, we didn't really find that beliefs were a driver either on macro or micro evolutionary levels, not you know, in the simple way that you might expect from approximate model. Um, we actually found, um, if you look down the bottom here, that what's going on in society. So when you've got warfare going on in society, that was generating a certain kind of belief. And at the micro level, the structure of your community was also one of the drivers, as was active participation in religion. And in the case of monasteries, they didn't appear to be a cost to the reproductive success of the families that were, at least in the context of the harsh climate of Tibet, there seems to be sufficient competition between brothers that it's actually beneficial for, uh, in terms of number of grandchildren, it's not costly to have sent one of your children uh, to join a monastery. So going back to our original very simple models, they're not really cognitive models, they're just you know, very simple kind of proximate models of what's going on. Um, quite a lot of areas in group one doesn't seem to be quite as simple as religious beliefs driving behavior. And in any way, that doesn't really give us a sort of theory of why religious beliefs are different in one part of the world from another. If we only had this arrow here, we, you know, we can't necessarily explain, I think, very easily what's going on. So obviously, as a behavioral ecologist, I, I much prefer model B, whereas I think ecology is setting up uh, differences in behavior which are somehow being codified into religious norms. Now I've left all these uh, arrows in, um, in going in both directions, because I'm not claiming it's, as, it's simple. It's obviously very complicated. There's lots of feedback. Religious beliefs will obviously uh, help to keep behavior from changing once it's been established, for example. Um, and in this case, religious beliefs might even be influencing ecology so this is for a future talk but obviously if one boy in seven is going to the monastery then the sex ratio has changed and therefore you've got not just ecology driving behavior but you've also you know you've got a whole circle going on here so finally I just want to thank my co-authors all of whom are really vital Kiran, Yuan, Jen, Alhao, Alberto, Jaja, May and Li Chong who all uh contributed very specific and completely vital um, bits to this research um, and especially those of them who lived in some of the study areas who made it possible for us to even work there. Obviously my supporters uh, institutionally UCL and University of Lanzhou and financially as well ERC. All the helpers, so, and several individuals helped us who were not necessarily in the author list, and also all the long suffering individuals who answered our questionnaires in the populations concerned. And here are um, lots of little monks interrupting their game of football, which they weren't very good at either, um, uh, to wave uh, goodbye. So, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. That was uh, very interesting. Um, if you stop sharing your screen and then we'll go into the, uh, the Q&A. Um, and just before we do that, I'll just remind everyone that we are doing the poll um, and I'll re-put the um, poll link in the chat. It's just to see where the participants today are joining from. Uh, we'd be very grateful if you could fill that out. Okay, so we have already got a question in the chat. So uh, Rachel Stone asks, any evidence on health of boys donated? Some medieval European monasteries complain about getting disabled slash unhealthy ch uh, child of the family as oblate offered child. I mean, we, we don't have any um, data on that specifically, but just sort of anecdotally, I mean, there's sort of, there's some, there can be an element uh, a, a, a sort of almost a, you know, so, I mean, some, I mean, there's a real range of children going to the monastery. So some of them might be from wealthy families, and some of them might be from destitute families who just need help and can't, you know, raise a child. And some of them might, you know, may may have difficulties. So you, so there's really the the, the full range. But we didn't really, um, 
you know, I can imagine that, you know, that, that there is a certain amount of a, a sort of charitable um, caring role going on as well. And that, that might well be the case. Um, so I had a question mm. actually. Um, so um, you're talking about um, sort of celibacy in males. I was wondering, mm. do you think there'd be any sort of difference in the cost for celibacy of females? So like nuns? Yeah, well, that's actually is something we're thinking about. And there were all, there are nunneries in this part of the world, but they, at least from our data, there were only, I mean, in, I can't remember the exact numbers, but, um, you know, in these villages where we had scores of males who were monks, I think we only got like two or three individuals who were nuns. And it did, I, I'm not entirely sure, because I haven't done much work on it yet, but um, it doesn't seem to be quite the same in that I'm not sure that they're sent at such a young age you know they're a little right. bit more likely to go a little bit older so I think there's something else possibly going on there um, but obviously there are parts of the world especially in Europe where there are a lot of nunneries and a lot of uh, nuns are sent to the monastery and you know Alberta is actually wanting to model this and has started modeling this in in a little bit more detail but in this particular case um I think I probably forgot to mention, and it may be key, uh, <laughs> that the Tibetan society is a sort of patrilocal and patrilineal kinship system. So that means that on the whole, for the most part, males stay put and are not dispersing. And it's the females. Females actually stay put a fair amount, especially since the communist revolution, where they now have the right to inherit land, which they didn't used to do. But um, um, they, you know, they, if males stay put, then they're competing with their brothers more for the resources. Right. And, and, you know, if there's male primogeniture and male biased inheritance, then who gets the farm, who gets the herd, you know, that's going to be competition between males. So that's why we think we saw the evolutionary benefit in to brothers, but not to sisters, because sisters were not in that competition anyway. Um, because they were not generally inheriting their father's resources, whereas the sons were competing to inherit their father's resources. So that's actually, you know, that's actually why um, we think that, that that's happening here. And there may be other parts of the world where dispersal patterns are different and therefore you get different patterns. Mm. It's very interesting. Mm. Um, so we do have time for maybe one more question if anyone does have a question for Ruth. Uh, Matea says, brilliant talk, thank you very much. <laughs> um, if not, then I guess we can, uh, oh, we have just had one come in. So uh, does celibacy guarantee holiness? Oh, well, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. I mean, we haven't really looked at the cognitive um, side of what's going on. We've really been looking at really, I mean, you know, we've been using essentially demographic data, like who who went to live in the monastery, who didn't, and, um, uh, you know, w what was the reproductive success sort of um, implications for the whole uh, family. But, it, I mean, it is interesting that um, many... Um, uh, religious I mean you know it's certainly not um, just this religion that, that demands celibacy of, of some of its practitioners I mean this is obviously very common across Christianity if some some you know oh, you know even going right back to shamanism celibacy is often part of what's demanded of your religious practitioners it might almost be part of the deal in other words you know I say the community is feeding them and you know so they are a cost to their community they're not they're not self-sufficient and you know these donations can be extremely large and i mean some of the festivals you see where people donate they're, they're donating you know in some of the areas like sort of one year in seven it's sort of your village's turn to donate to the monastery and um families donate huge proportion of their food and 
livestock and all sorts of things to the monastery. It's quite extraordinary to watch. Um, and, you know, it may be, if you like, almost part of the deal that you're celibate, you know, <laughs> you're stepping out of the reproductive competition and we'll feed you, but not if you're, you know, mm. not, not if you're, not if you're, you know, getting married and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, might be part of the deal. Okay, so it is uh, four minutes past two, so I guess we'll uh, close it there. So thank you very much, Ruth, for a great, uh, yeah, great talk and great Q and A, and thank you everybody for coming along today. And we'll see you next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.